Welcome to Journey Church. If we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Would you do me a favor and put your hands together for those who are online? God bless you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us from wherever you find yourself today. Well, Thanksgiving is now behind us and we're looking forward to the most wonderful time of the year, right? I mean, I just love this time of the year. Maybe you do too. Christmas is right around the corner and it is the celebration of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords and hopefully he is the Lord over your heart as well. I'm using those words very intentionally today, as you'll see, as part of our message as we're kicking off this new series today entitled, The King is Here. Before we go there, I want to thank you and commend you on your heart for missions. You know, last week we had a very special missions Sunday, and you guys uh, sponsored over 80 children from Zimbabwe. Would you give yourselves a big round of applause? Really amazing. If you happen to miss it and would like to learn uh, learn a little bit more information about it, I assure you go to the uh, Next Step station and they'll connect you with one of the staff who could give you information on how you too could sponsor one of the children from the work in Zimbabwe. Uh, Pastor Adam is leaving this coming week to go there and visit with them directly himself and we're excited for him. Bishop's going with him I think as well too, so you guys have a big trip planned. When are you guys leaving? This Tuesday? Man, what, where's Adam? Come on back up here if you're around. Bishop, come up here. We've got to pray for you guys before you go. I don't know if Adam's still here. Sorry to catch you off guard. This was a little unplanned moment, but uh, if anybody sees Pastor Adam, bring him on up. There we go. Sorry about that, Adam. We just pulled an audible, man. <laughs> So these guys are going to Bulawayu, uh, Zimbabwe. They're going to be ministering at some of the churches there. While they're there, they're going to see some of the water well projects that we've already started. And also, they're going to get to meet some of the children that you sponsored this past weekend. So let's go ahead and pray for them, if you will. Feel free to extend an arm as an act of faith, if you'd like. Lord, we just pray over Bishop and Pastor today. And thank you so much for them and their heart for children all around the world, for the least of these, Lord God. You've put it in their heart. And you're sending them there with the opportunity to minister, Lord Jesus. Would you use them in mighty ways that would impact the generations there, Lord? Would you use the people of Journey Church to continue to make a difference for those who are lost and hurting in need of a touch from their Savior? Lord, bless them, guide them, direct them, get them there safely and get them back safely. But while they're there, would you use them? Would their hearts be impacted as well? Would they just be knit together with those kids in Bulawayo? And and Father, just use them mightily in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. And God bless you guys. Father, we do just pray one more time over this service as we get started, Lord Jesus. Would you touch our hearts, touch our minds? Would we come to realize just how desperately in need of not just a Savior we are, but of a King, of a Lord over our lives, of a good and benevolent Creator who loves us and was willing to send His Son to die for us? Lord, I pray there would be people here under the sound of my voice today who don't have a relationship with you, but during the course of this message that you would stir their hearts and draw them by the power of the Holy Spirit into a relationship with you for the very first time. Would this be a day that they would remember for all their lives and reckon into eternity in Jesus' name? And everybody says, amen. Amen. So my role today is really to set up the next couple of weeks as we start this Christmas series entitled, The King is Here. But before we could really talk about why it is truly the most wonderful time of the year, we need to understand, even as I prayed, how desperately we are in need of a Savior. How desperate we need a King of Kings and Lord of Lords over our life, right? There's a real battle that we're facing, and I'll describe it a little bit during the course of this message today, but it's important that we understand the things that I'm talking about today. It's important to note that from the beginning, God created us as worshipers, and we were created to have a king. You were created to worship the creator of the universe. He put that in your very DNA. In the book of Revelation chapter 17, it describes him as the king of kings, as the Lord of lords. Revelation 4 describes him as the Lord God Almighty who is seated on the throne. 
Right now, he is seated on the throne. He's not freaking out about all the stuff that you see going on in the world right now. He's on the throne. He's in control of everything. I hope that brings you some peace today. In our sinfulness sometimes, though, we settle for cheap substitutes. They seemingly fill and momentarily satisfy our souls, but leave us later with nothing but a huge void in our life. The very fact that the Bible tells us that God the Father is the capital King of Kings, capital K, King of Kings, capital L, a Lord of Lords, tells us that there are little K Kings and little L Lords, and sometimes we try to act like them. We become them in our own lives. But nonetheless, there are powers and principalities in heavenly places that seek to overtake the real throne of God. Guess what? He's going to be victorious in the end. Aren't you glad you could read to the end of the book, right? God is in control. But this does speak to the fact that there are other kings striving to take God's place in your soul. It's important to also understand as we get started that there are heavens, plural, right? Heavens. You could learn about them more if you continue to read in the Bible and study it deeply. Watch. But there are two kingdoms right now that are at war with each other in the heavens, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. It's imperative that we understand these things. The Bible describes this moment of Satan's fall in Isaiah 14, 12. He says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, capital G, God, right? He was declaring himself to be God. He was willfully acting in rebellion against God. He said, guess what? I'm going to make myself the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How many of you know God had another plan, right? He was so successful and he was so eloquent in that moment that a third of all the angels, the Bible tells us later in Scripture, actually go with them. We now know them as demonic angels, the hordes of the heavens that are up there that are set against your very destruction. These are foundational truths that we need to understand as believers. We need to understand that we're in a battle. Sometimes we want to sweep it under the rug. We want to act like everything's fine and dandy and wonderful, but guess what? There's a war going on all around us that's as real and even more real than what the people in Gaza and Israel and Ukraine and other places around the world are experiencing in this very moment. There are real casualties in that war. We've all experienced it in our own families. One of the things that you'll notice is that in earthly wars, countries often like to wage war on other people's land. They don't want to mess up their own, right? So they go invade other places and fight wars in other places. We see it happening right now, even even as we speak. The war in the heavens is fought much in the same way. There's battles that are going on in heavens, but oftentimes it's manifested here on earth, right? And there are real casualties to those wars. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that oftentimes earthly kings, earthly rulers are just puppets being controlled by powers and principalities in heavenly places. We can't put our hope and our trust in earthly kings. We can't put our trust in Joe Biden. We can't put our trust in Trump. We can't put our trust in whoever the next candidate might be. Chances are, guess what? They're going to fail you. Chances are they're going to fail us, right? Because they're earthly kings. They're little K kings. They're strings being pulled and manipulated by powers and principalities that are very real in heavenly places. The battles that we experience here on earth are collateral damage associated with the epic battle that's been taking taking place in the heavens far longer than human beings have even been in existence. It's been going on for a long time. We talked about Satan's fall just a moment ago. 
So why, though, are human beings the primary target of the enemy? Tells us right up front, Genesis 127, you and I were created and formed in the image of God. Satan hates that. He wants to destroy that. It says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Do you hear the kingdom language? Dominion. You were created to rule and reign. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you were created to rule and reign. You weren't created to be second best. God created you to go out there and have dominion, to lead. Yet in our own generation, we sit back while the devil rages before us. I watched an absolutely outrageous video of a pastor that got up in front of a school board and he's reading some text that they're giving to little children. And guess what? They kicked him off the stage because when he was speaking, he was sharing such vulgarity that couldn't be heard in a school board meeting. But guess what? That's the stuff that the enemy is giving to the children in our own generation. He's attacking the children. As I was coming in this morning, I think I said to Mary Jo, just a spontaneous moment, he will seek to kill the kids while they're in the womb, and if he can't get them there, he tries to kill them just after. How crazy is that? That's how real this war is. As God came to release us to lovingly have dominion, it says that Satan's mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. He takes no prisoners. He wants to take us out. He wants to take your family out. But guess what? You were made in the image of God. You were created to reflect his glory. And Satan can continue hating that. But guess what? The king is going to win. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. The Bible describes this moment very early on where that snake of old Satan himself slithers into the garden and convinces Adam and Eve, he tempts them with the notion that they too could be like God, knowing good and evil. How many of you wish we had no clue of what evil is? Oh my goodness. Lord, would we long for that day where no evil exists anymore. Sadly, he was successful and now sin lurks deep within us as human beings. It separates us from the God of the universe. It separates us from our one true king. We were created to worship the king, but in our sinfulness, in our sinful nature, God can't have sin in his presence, right? It creates this vacuum, this void, this chasm between us and God. And sometimes we think our sins just aren't that bad. Oh, so-and-so sins are much worse than ours. But the standard here is perfection, right? Our sins truly prevent us from being in the very presence of God. And there is no solution other than the King of kings and Lord of lords, his son whom he sent to die in our place for our sins that we might have life, right? Every human being is born separated from God and in need of a savior. This brings us to the life verse for this message, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It says, as for you, he's speaking to believers here, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Did you hear that word rulers? It's a little K king, a little L lord, but guess what? That doesn't mean that they're not powerful. You cannot take on Satan alone, I'm here to tell you. You cannot take on even one of his demons alone. If God could send just a couple of his heavenly angels and wipe out hordes of armies, you're telling me that demons aren't kind of powerful either? I'm here to tell you that they are, right? They definitely are. They're real and they're out to get you. We've talked about this a few times already during this message. But guess what? If you're not part of the kingdom of heaven, that means you're part of another kingdom. Right? 
And we don't care to admit that. We don't care to see that. We could live any way we want, the way we want, and nobody could tell us what to do, right? Only God can judge me. How true. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> right? That's how bold we are. We'll even write that on our bodies. We'll tattoo that. Only God can judge me. Man, we should fear the judgment seat of Christ one day. But guess what? He's also talking to believers there, right? So we need to think about that for a moment. If there's still active sin going on in your life, guess what? It doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. But it does mean that Satan still has dominion over certain areas of your life. Do you want him ruling over those areas of your life? Would you then submit yourself even today and say, Lord, this particular area, I have not been able to submit to you. Lord God, would you take, I take it to the cross. Would you remove it from me? I want to glorify you in every way. If our job is to reflect the image of God, we need to ask ourselves periodically, the Bible actually even says, test me in this, right? Where we need to test our faith and see if it's in alignment with his word. And when it's not, man, we need to take that to God and we need to fight and go to war against the sin in our life. It's not meant to be there. As we get older and older, we need to look more like Jesus, talk more like Jesus, act more like Jesus. The Bible says that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we look into a mirror and gaze at it, and yes, it is dirty, but each time we submit ourselves to Christ, he wipes it off a little bit more, and he wipes it off a little bit more, and he wipes it off a little bit more, and then the image one day right before we get to go to be with him, how cool would that be if it looks kind of just like him, right? That's the kind of life you're called to lead. And young people, especially you, if you get it right now, how amazing would that be? You don't have to fight many of the battles that we did. As humans, we are certainly human, but there's a tinge of the divine because we were created and formed in the image of God, right? We, like Satan and his demons, have a tendency to make ourselves little G gods and little K kings and little A lords with our own kingdoms. We try to build our own kingdoms, but we're not meant to do that. Yes, we're called to be second, not first. We're called to reflect his image, not try to create our own. And don't you see it out there in the world on full display as all the different rock stars and artists and musicians and, and uh, you know, sports figures, so many of them try to glorify themselves. We live in a day and age where the apostasy grows on a daily basis, right? Think about social media and what it's done with all the influencers. We have these things that we call selfies. We're not to bear our own image, we're to bear his image. And then we'll go take those pictures from all different kinds of angles trying to make sure they look just right. And if they don't look just right, you grab the AI features that go doctor it up and make you look even better than you really are. And then when you meet in person, you're like, who is this person? I've never met you before. I saw you online, but I don't know who you are. We try to put forward this best image of ourselves. That's not the life that God's created us to live. We're not called to build our own kingdoms. We are not the king. There is but one king. We think we're in charge, but guess what? There are two kingdoms. I'll bring it back to that point. You're either building and advancing. God actually said you're either with me or you're against me, right? You're either advancing the kingdom of God, or even if you think you're building your own little kingdom, you're actually advancing the kingdom of Satan at that moment. We got to be aware of this, believers. We can't go on living in our sin. We can't go on spending time in these sinful things that the world partakes in and think that it's okay. Now, I've shared a lot of challenging stuff, but is there hope? This is supposed to be a Christmas series. I see Christmas trees and Christmas lights. And you just said early on that this is the most wonderful time of the year. Why are you starting off so harsh? Well, I told you that I got to set it up, right? We got to understand just how desperately in need of a savior that we really are to really understand just how good the good news of Jesus Christ really is. See, there's this moment in Isaiah shortly after it talks of Satan's rebellion where God talks about what's going to happen to him. My paraphrase, I'm thinking of God sitting there and saying, oh, you think you could take my place? Oh, yeah, come on, it's on now, right? Isaiah 14, 15. 
Yet you, Satan, shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze upon you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble? The one who shook the kingdoms? Who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? But notice, he does destroy the cities. He does make certain places barren and a wilderness. He's doing it right now. He's doing it before our very eyes. Just look at the news. But listen to that language yet again, just to remind ourselves. It's language of kingdom and conquering. The kingdom of God was meant to be on a forceful advance until Jesus comes back and sets all things right. Kingdoms are meant to advance or else they start to decline and go away, right? But the kingdom of God will endure forever and forever. Any earthly kingdom will yet pass away. Satan is attempting to advance his kingdom, and right now it is seeming like he is getting the victory. That's what you see playing out right now in places like Ukraine and in Israel. That's what every war that's ever been fought has been fought about. It's mimicking what's going on with the war in heavenly places as Satan lives in all-out rebellion against God. But one of the things that demons do that we shouldn't do as believers that sometimes we do is they fight against themselves. You'll see them play it out. They'll go to war for power amongst themselves and they'll kill each other and they'll beat each other up. You got one faction against another faction. In the kingdom of God, it says there should be unity and peace under the power of the Holy Spirit. Yet sometimes the devil gets into even churches and causes us to divide against one another. Because if we're in unity, the kingdom of God is unstoppable. The kingdom advance of Jesus Christ is unstoppable. But we can't fall for the tactics of the enemy. So here is the good news. From the very moment of our initial sin, when God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, he promised us a savior who would come to be the rescue of all mankind. He would ultimately restore us the right relationship with God the Father that we could once again be part of the family of God and rule and reign with him forevermore into all eternity. You see, the coming Christmas season is not really about Santa Claus or presents. You know what? The first thing to go in every war is the truth. Have you ever heard that statement? You look at the propaganda as the Israeli conflict with Gaza started, and man, you didn't know what to believe. Everything's potentially a lie. One side saying this, the other side saying that. I sadly tell you that, you know, why do you think they propagate Santa and other things of this generation? It's but a propaganda to steal from what the real reason for the season is, right? He tries to use those things. What, you know, I'm not going to go there. There might be kids in the room right now, but... uh, I I don't know. (laughs) But I remember the moment that I came to the realization that the big S was not real. I was in a car with my mom. I could still remember that moment. I'm like, you lied to me all this time? And then he started crying. You mean the EB guy that hops around is also not real? (laughs) Tell me not the tooth fairy. Oh, my God. But the devil's literally got us as believers to go lie to our kids. Go lie to them and tell them this stuff. It all sounds good. It's a good story. Fat guy going around. Can't fit through chimneys, but somehow gets down. The propaganda of the enemy, the lies of the enemy are so deep that it'll even feel like it's good. Feels like it's good but he's getting us to lie like he lies because he's a liar at his core. How crazy is it? Jesus, help us. Christmas is about the fact that God sent his one and only son. Amen. His one, man, have you seen the pictures, both sides, Gaza and Israel, as they reunited with the kids from the conflict and stuff, the look on their faces, the joy on their faces? Could you imagine sending your one and only son off to go to battle off to die for a people who were generally, you know, rejected them. But how 
How amazing is God? The one and only son of God who came from heaven to earth, was born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless, spotless life, died a sinner's death on the cross, all that our sins might be forgiven, that we might become part of his family. That's the real reason for the season. If you haven't met him, if you haven't found him, I pray you would do so now. Christmas is about the fact that a king was born in Bethlehem who is the savior of the world. I think we often readily admit our need for a savior, right? But we like to have just a little bit of rebellion and don't want a king. We don't want a Lord. We don't want someone who could help set the standards for right and wrong and tell us what we should or should not do, even if it is for our own benefit. That's that tinge of sinful rebellion that still lies within us as believers. We readily call him savior, but man, today I pray you would call him king and Lord and that you would submit all of your life under his lordship. Say, take it away from me. If it is not of you, man, as much as I've coddled it, as much as I've held on to it, as much as I've embraced it, Lord, would you make that thing that is not of you distasteful to me this very morning? Would I lay it down willfully that I could serve you all the more? That Christmas day some 2,000 years ago marked the beginning of the end for Satan and his battle. Resurrection Sunday ultimately sealed his fate. In our generation, he's running around like a roaring lion seeking whom he could devour because he knows he's on his last leg. He knows that the king is about to return and make all things right. So he wants to take as many people with him to that place called hell and Hades as he can. He doesn't want God to get the worship. He wants to steal the worship. He's willing to go to battle against his own kind, so to speak. And he wants to take out every human being along with him. The time is short. But for those who call on the name of Jesus, there's hope. Listen to the words of Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. I just love this. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy for all the people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel and a great multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God and the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. He ushered in joy. He ushered in freedom like we sang about earlier. It was the beginning of it, but right now we're still in the midst of that battle and ultimately we will experience the fullness of joy when we go to be with him. We'll experience the fullness of peace when we go to be with him. One day soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. He's returning to get his bride. He wants us to be spotless and holy and in love with him. So there's a choice that every human being has to make. Frankly, even the angels had to make a decision on that day of rebellion. Whom will you serve, right? Whom will you serve with this knowledge and understanding of what I've shared with you today, that there are two kingdoms that are at war with one another, that Satan is real and God is real today. With that knowledge, we're forced to choose. Even the Jewish people of old in Joshua 24, 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, the L-O-R-D, the capital Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers on the other side of the river served in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the little g gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the little g gods of the Amorites and those whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. One person's excited. Hallelujah, Jesus. I guess you already made your choice. Would you rise with me?
Today the King is here. Holy Spirit, work by the sound of my voice, Lord God. Not me, but you. And I ask you today, choose this day whom you will serve. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory today. You are our King. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are our Abba Father, our Daddy. We come to you in all humility, some may be for the very first time, as you're impressing on their heart this very moment, the fact that you are Savior and Lord. And if that is you today and you want to surrender your life to God and join this way of life and become a follower of Jesus Christ and find yourselves one day entering into the gates of heaven, man, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Maybe today you're a person who is a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't believe you could lose your salvation, but sometimes there comes a moment of rededication where you've maybe walked away for a little while and today you're saying, man, the battle is real. I've been in it. I've experienced it. I don't want any more of it. And Lord, I am ready to return to you. Nothing at all wrong with that today. If you want to re-surrender your life to Jesus, I'd love to pray for you in a moment as well. There also might be believers in this room that you're struggling with something right now. You haven't been able to overcome it. God wants to set you free. Did you hear that song we sang earlier today? Freedom. He came to set the captives free. You've been trapped behind enemy lines. And just as those Jewish people that were released as hostages and came back to greet their family, God wants to free you from the chains that bind you today. You no longer have to be subject to that mess. Man, I'd love to pray for you if that's you as well. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if you need to surrender your life to Jesus today, would you do me a favor right now? Surrender or re-surrender? Just put your hand up real high right where you're at. I'd love to pray for you. Is there anybody here today? You need to dedicate. I see your hand over there. Hallelujah, Jesus, and yours, and yours, and yours, and yours, and yours. Hallelujah, Lord. Hands all over the place. I'm going to ask you to do something really bold if you raised your hand. I know this could be a little, it's not embarrassing at all, but I mean, you're amongst friends. But man, God, the Father says, if you declare me before men, I will declare you before my Father is in heaven. We're in a real war. We're in a real battle. And man, we can't hide behind enemy lines. It's time to come out. If that's you and you raised your hand, come up here to the front right now. Everybody applaud for them. If you raised your hand, come up here. I'd love to pray for you. Join me up here. Come on, give them glory. Give them glory. Give him glory. Thank you, Lord. Come on up. I'm going to come down and pray with you guys in just a moment. If that's you, keep coming. Come on. Got prayer warriors here with you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. Give him a little bit of glory. If you didn't come down and wanted to, give him more glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. He is the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. All right. Come on. Keep coming down. We'll take it. Come on, Jesus. Get the glory you deserve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. As they're starting to pray, I I just sense that there's somebody that might be going through something today, and today's your day to be set free. Man, you know, I was addicted. I had all kinds of issues. And man, that day I ran up to the front, God did something in my heart and began to change everything. Man, if you're struggling in some area, I want to encourage you to do me a favor and raise your hand right where you're at and I'll pray for you right now. Everybody bow your heads because I don't want anybody to be embarrassed. Man, if that's you, raise your hand up high right where you're at. You need some help. You're a believer in Jesus Christ, but you're struggling. I see your hand. There's hands all over right now going up all over. One more group I'd love to just have joined. If you, we all know somebody who's struggling right now in our sphere of influence. If you're willing to pray for them and ask God to set them free right now, will you raise your hand up real high right where you're at? Would you pray for them and intercede right now? Hey, if you, if you raised your hand in any way, shape, or form and want to come to the front, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. He's, we're going to just pray right now. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory today. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, feel free to come up. If you want to be set free, feel free to come up. Come on, Jesus. We thank you and we praise you today. We acknowledge you not only as Savior, but as King, as Lord over our life. 
Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross.